Azerbaijan is tucked away in a small corner of this world. Even so, it takes not days or weeks or months, but years to travel this land from the Caspian Sea to the greater and lesser Caucasus mountains. So much time is needed, not just because of the size of the country. As you get to know Azerbaijan, an endless vista will open before you, rich in flora and fauna, artifacts, excavations, and cultural and historic heritage. The country has a varied landscape and climate. Maybe this is why every region, every town, every village, be it far away in the mountains or close to the capital, has its own colours and shades, its own character. Each and every journey to Azerbaijan is a voyage of discovery. Every time you marvel at the Talish forests, the mysterious immemorial drawings of age-old Gobustan, the orchards and winding roads of Ordubad, relics of another age amidst the hard grey crags, Nakhchivan's snake mountain and salt caves, the green forests of Guba, the glittering waters of Goigirl, Maralgirl, Khambuanchai and Nohur, mirrors to the sky, the red bloom as the sun sets over the near unreachable Khinalik, the quietly flowing Araz, Kur and Sugrovush, the road snaking through the green forested mountains of Sheki, Lahij's neat narrow streets of Riverstone, sheltered between steep cliffs and filled with the age-old rhythmic ring of the coppersmiths and blacksmiths' hammers. The enigmatic expanse, bright green hills, mountains and plateau of Shusha. This is Azerbaijan. At every inch of your way, an ancient land converses with the past. As you stroll through these places, you see the endless miracles of Mother Nature. Where else in the world can you see water and fire united? Where else can you see the sea, the earth, the mountains burn with unquenchable flames? After all, Azerbaijan is known as the land of fire. Once upon a time, innumerable fire worshippers from India, Shiraz, Isfahan, all the corners of the earth, flocked on pilgrimage to this sacred land. And the Caspian. Baku begins at the shore of the Caspian. It's impossible to imagine Baku without the Caspian, and truth to tell, it's impossible to imagine the Caspian without Baku. The legendary Maiden Tower stands at the junction of water and dry land. Look, from here, up above the Maiden Tower, nothing could appear closer to those blue waters. According to legend, unable to join her true love, the Khan's daughter flung herself from the tower into the embrace of those blue waves. The 14th century Shirvan Shah's palace has not yet revealed its secrets to anyone. Some say that it was the summer residence of the Shirvan Shahs, others that it was their courthouse, whereas others think it had quite a different purpose. These stones announce the presence of what's known as the Caspian Atlantis, a city today beneath the waves. This fortress with the historical name Sabael was built on one of the islands of the Caspian in 1235 by order of the third Shirvan Shah, Feri Burzu. But in 1305, an earthquake caused the waters of the Caspian to rise and the fortress was submerged by the sea. Only four centuries later, in 1723, when the waters of the Caspian began to recede, were the upper parts of the forgotten castle revealed. But soon afterwards, the Caspian Atlantis was again submerged. From the late 19th century, Baku began to grow steadily beyond the walls of the old Icheri Shehe into a modern city. Today, fine examples of 20th century and the latest 21st century architecture can be found here. The Haydar Aliyev Centre in central Baku, designed by famous British architect Zaha Hadid, has earned a reputation as the boldest of experiments and the grandest project of our era. Multiculturalism is our way of life. President of the Azerbaijan Republic used this phrase in an interview with the Russia 24 TV channel in November 2014. You will see it for yourself as you travel through Azerbaijan. People of different religions and ethnic groups live together here. Their joys, problems, cares and hopes for the future are the same. It's impossible to imagine our society any other way. The Ujis, descendants of the ancient Caucasian Albanians, live in the village of Nij in Gebele district. 50% of the population of Nij are Udi, 40% Azerbaijani 
and 10% Lesgi. Come to this village to see how people live in Nietzsche, their peaceful, industrious way of life in the foothills of the Caucasus. The village is not so large, but ancient Albanian churches and two mosques are open for worship here. The Red Village, or Gimizi Kent, stands in a pleasant spot on the banks of the Gujal Chai River, on the road to Gusa in Guba district. Over the years it has had many names, Gudial, the Jewish settlement, and Krasnaya Sloboda, or the Red Settlement during the Soviet era, which in Azerbaijani is Gimizi Kent. The people of the village are Jewish and speak their own language. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, large numbers of the population emigrated to Europe, Israel or America. But most of the emigrants did not cut ties with their home village. They have fine, attractive modern houses in the village and often visit. The people here speak Azerbaijani so well that it's impossible to tell from their speech if they are Azerbaijani or Jewish. They often give their children Azerbaijani names. A 13th century synagogue is still open for worship in the village. Ivanovka lies between the rivers of Goychai and Devebatan. Its people are Molokan Christians, who have lived here since they came from Russia in the 17th century. The old rules are strictly observed. For example, during the day, it's very difficult to find anyone to chat to in the streets or squares. Everyone is at work on the collective farm, or their own small holdings, or in workshops. They like to relax in the evenings. You have to cross steep ravines to reach Khinalig. The village has remained unchanged. Satellite dishes on the rooftops have not been able to change it. The people cannot change, they are constant as the mountains. The people of Khinalig have their own language, but they speak to us in Azerbaijani. As atheism was the main ideology during the Soviet period, in Azerbaijan, as in the other republics, many churches, synagogues and even more mosques were either demolished or at best used for other purposes, for example as grain stores or clubs. After Azerbaijan won its independence, on the personal initiative of our people's national leader, Haydar Aliyev, synagogues and Orthodox churches and the Catholic Church were restored and their doors opened again to welcome worshippers. On the 22nd to 24th of May 2002, the late head of the Roman Catholic Church, Pope John Paul II, visited the Republic. Azerbaijan's First Lady, President of the Haydar Aliyev Foundation, Mehriban Aliyeva, met Pope Francis during a visit to Italy and the Vatican. Noting that relations between Azerbaijan and the Vatican are on an upward curve, Mrs. Aliyeva said that this cooperation should be further expanded in the area of preservation of cultural heritage. The First Lady told the Pope about important projects of the Haydar Aliyev Foundation, both in Azerbaijan and several other countries in a variety of areas, including social and humanitarian work. Multiculturalism means harmony, doesn't nature tell us of its God-given harmony? Don't the nine climatic zones of Azerbaijan talk of unity within diversity? Different peoples live as one family in one land, a result of the successful policy of the country's leadership. Is this not living in the harmony of tolerance in the true meaning of the word? The harmony of nature is God's blessing. And wouldn't we be right to call the breaking of this harmony an unforgivable sin? Thank you.